collaboration or conversations amongst educators and practitioners with similar interests to create professional networks and a community of practice, if you will, both within and across professions. Here, our hope today is pretty modest. We want to begin seeding such a conversation around medical education. And so we've brought a group together, some folks who know each other, some folks who don't, uh, to begin this conversation. We had a similar discussion uh, late November amongst engineers. Uh, there was great energy and excitement. So we thought we'd try it again with medical professionals. So thanks for jumping in and joining us in this experiment. Um, I think, you know, sort of building community over Zoom is always a, a bit of a logistical challenge, but let's see how it goes. Um, in terms of a couple of logistics before we get rolling, um, please note that there are several folks in the background. Uh, should you have any technical issues, they will swiftly jump in to resolve them um, and help you out with whatever you might need. Uh, second, we will actually be recording the first 40 minutes of this conversation. Um, and so what I'm gonna ask each of you to do is as we begin that conversation, turn off your video. It's not that we don't wanna record your beautiful smiling face. Rather, we just wanna make sure it's easy for the people on the panel to really see one another as, as they engage. Um, we're gonna have the open conversation run for about 40 minutes, and then we'll have a set of breakouts. We'll return together and close up the day. So with that, I wanna turn uh, the conversation over to Dr. Joseph Jackson, Associate Dean of Student Affairs in the School of Medicine and Associate Professor of Pediatrics here at Duke, who will lead a conversation with Dr. Rini Abraham, at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center, Dr. Lydia Dugdale, Silverberg Associate Professor of Medicine and Director of the Center for Clinical Medical Ethics in the Department of Medicine at Columbia University, and Andrea Leap Hunderfund, Professor of Neurology, Associate Director of the Program for Professionalism and Values, and Director of the Learning Environment and Education at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, I, I'm not actually gonna share further information on people's bios. Um, you received that information, so I hope you take a look at some of these illustrious path-breaking individuals. And I'm gonna turn it over to Joe, and thank you very much for joining the conversation. Let's have some fun. Yes, well, thank you so much. Um, I just, as you were speaking, I was reminded, I think I've had so many Zoom sessions and lectures where there's been a, a strong desire to get students to turn their videos on. And we've just asked everyone to turn them off. So I think that's the first time that I've, I've actually heard that out loud. But um, hopefully this will be an opportunity for us to engage in dialogue all together. Um, I am honored uh, to have an opportunity uh, to be here with everyone. And I look forward to learning from each of you as we talk together. I do just quickly wanna just say a, a big thank you to the entire Keenan Institute for Ethics team just for the invitation and also for creating this kind of space for us to have this dialogue together. Um, I'm honored to be a moderator for this panel discussion this afternoon and I'm also honored to be joined by my colleagues who in many ways have demonstrated a track record of excellence, particularly in the area of professional formation. So just to get us started, you know, there's an, an increasing recognition um, as we think about what it means to be a healthcare professional and how one prepares to be a healthcare professional. It certainly requires clinical expertise um, and it's acknowledged very well in the literature that it requires professional competence. And I think the medical literature highlights aspects like knowledge and skills and behaviors as key components in this process of professional identity formation. And so really today in our discussion, I really want us to explore this question. How does virtue connect with these behaviors and attitudes that we hope to see in a healthcare professional? So now just by simply acknowledging that we all showed up to this Zoom call, I think it's sort of, um, uh, um, we can conclude that, that all of us are probably in a space where we already are convinced that virtue has a really important place in the health professions. Um, but questions for us today, you know, we do need to think a little bit about how we actually cultivate it and how do we actually implement it, particularly in the educational spaces where we walk. Um, and so my hope is that each of you will join um, the panelists and I as we talk together 
about perceived challenges and even begin to think through how we might overcome those challenges as we learn from one another. As I think about the aims for our time today, I'm hoping that each of us will be inspired by some new ideas, that each of us may even be challenged by some differing perspectives and hopefully will even be motivated to create connections and even pursue community with one another. So with that, let's turn now to our first question. And this is open to any of the panelists who are joining today. This is the why question. Why does cultivating character and virtue matter in the practice of medicine? Let's begin there. So I, I can start. Um, thank you so much for um, inviting me to this panel. I'm um, equally excited as everybody has talked about, um, about learning from all of you and also um, in uh, embarking on some community. Man, community in the time of COVID, uh, even more important. So I think, um, you know, we sent these uh, questions to all of us ahead of time. So I reflected a little bit about this question. And there were two things that really came to mind for me. And, and that was the importance of remembering our medical profession's history um, and how much that's a reminder to me why cultivating character and virtue really matters. And I think back about times where our profession has had some ethical missteps. And I think about the physician experiments um, during um, the time of, um, you know, Nazi rule. And I think about the Tuskegee syphilis experiments, um, as well as, you know, publications that were published um, that um, really highlighted fallacies about racial inferiority and all in the name of, of science. And to me, that's such a call and an important call of uh, creating a deliberate curriculum on what does character and virtue look like for a profession. And the second thing I really think about is, is the epidemic of burnout. And we all hear about it and read about this all the time. Um, it's, it's led to some um, outstanding, you know, astounding um, high rates of suicide amongst medical professions, some that we know about and some that are, are hard to, to capture in, in, in some of our professions, like with our nurses and other professionals that we don't always know how to capture that, that number. Um, and also attrition amongst our learners. Um, so people who quit medical school because it's not what they thought it should be is in also once they've worked um, in their careers, how they leave the profession. And um, so those are the kind of the two things that really stuck out to me. Excellent. You know, when I was thinking about that question, you know, the discourse in medical education right now is so powerfully driven by this idea of competence and what is it that we can do? What are the skills? What are the abilities, the capabilities that we have? And many of you talked about um, this idea of professional identity formation that takes it a step further from what can I do to who am I, who, I'm, who am I becoming as a professional? And where I see virtue in vocation is pushing that conversation even further to say, why am I? and who should I try to become? And by extension, how should I live as a result? So I think virtue really um, helps advance the conversation in a way that connects to the idea of purpose and meaning and vocation and invites us to grapple with some of those issues that otherwise may be left unattended or, um, or, or, or implicit. Uh, so I think that's what gets me especially excited about thinking about virtue and in, in medicine. I love being on panels because I learn so much from my colleagues and I also love going last because I like to hear all the, the good ideas. Um, and I, th I was thinking when I was thinking through these questions yesterday, I thought of a, a couple of things very different and that is uh, the culture in medicine, which we'll talk about in some of the subsequent questions is so strong that if there's zero emphasis put on character formation, uh, on virtue cultivation, we will have entire generations of completely wayward physicians. Um, I think there's some holdout. I mean, maybe in the South, everything, you know, there's just people are more uh, virtuous than in the Northeast. I mean, maybe, right? Uh, but but I have a lot of students that have sort of zero um, ethical formation, whether that's from a religious tradition or a strong set of moral beliefs that were inculcated in them. I, I have 
students that have zero. Um, and so you can tell them, you know, let's cultivate compassion, uh, but they, they aren't seeing it modeled very well. And uh, what they're seeing is, is really a drive to efficiency uh, and generating revenue. And, and that's, that's what's dominating. Um, clinical excellence, but not, not uh, relational uh, excellence or not humanity uh, in, the, in the care of uh, the delivery of clinically excellent care. So that's, that's one thing. If, if we don't make any effort, I, I do, at least in the Northeast, we're gonna have, we're gonna have uh, some trouble. Uh, the second thing is when I think about the practice of medicine itself. I'm a primary care doctor and I guess a COVID doctor these days, uh, but I, I walk with my patients uh, age 18 to, to the end. And um, I think of that as for all of the things about medical practice that make me nuts, the, all of the ways that healthcare is broken and in primary care, it's especially broken. I still still believe that that relationship with my patients is really kind of a sacred, almost holy relationship, and that it's an enormous privilege and gift for me, even in the maddening clinical environment, to be able to serve. And so, I see that this care of the sick and vulnerable as is really you know sacred work, and sacred work requires a certain kind of approach that isn't uh, formed uh, through conventional medical education. And so that's why I, I think we need this. The, the why is because we're talking about sick and vulnerable patients who are opening up their, you know, their hearts and lives and souls and you know, come to us in their full nudity, uh, literally, um, trusting that we will care well for them. Uh, so that's why we need to cultivate virtue. These are such wonderful thoughts. I'm, as I'm listening to each of you, I feel like I've found my people. So this is <laughs> so wonderful to hear you reflect on, on, on that response. You know, as I thought through this question, you know, I, I was just reminded of the way that um, so much of the work that I'm doing when I'm with my patients and with learners, um, it's not um, always clear the direction that needs to happen in a particular moment. And I find that with many learners, um, they kind of show up at the table expecting that, just tell me what I need to do and I'll get it done. And they really kind of are sort of dumbfounded by the thought that like, actually there's like a lot of gray and there's decisions that aren't gonna be sort of just black and white. And in the midst of that, you're gonna need to know who you are and what you think about yourself. And you're gonna need to have sort of some level of formation of your own identity that is going to allow you to make decisions for the patients and the people that are in front of you. And so I kind of think of this as sort of the why for me is like, you know, medicine is not clean. It's not just tell me what to do and I'll go do it. There's nuance and there's moral reasoning and there's all of these things that are taking place. And without thinking about the virtue of the individual, we sort of miss the opportunity to actually be able to have an effect the way that I think we ought. So that's kind of the first. And then, you know, the second reason I think this topic is so important is, um, you know, there are a lot of, you know, errors and mistakes that happen all over the place. It doesn't matter what your profession is, but those things are going to occur. And it's concerned me for a while that there seems to be an increasing number of learners who have somehow not really seen it modeled how one makes a mistake and learns from that mistake or returns to ask for forgiveness and say that they messed up and try to do things differently. And when I kind of sort of um, peel back the layers of that issue, it seems like a lot of what's happening is the absence of virtue and the absence of recognizing that there is some, some moral compass and some responsibility that you have um, to the folks that are in front of you, even when you make errors, even when you make mistakes. And so I envision a healthcare field where healthcare providers are quick to acknowledge and own the things that they've done wrong and quick to acknowledge some of their own weakness for the sake of their patients. So that for me is a big part of why I'm excited that we get to have this conversation today. So thank you all for commenting on that. Rini, were you gonna add something there? Yeah, well, I was just thinking um, that yeah, I think it's important to cultivate it in our learners, but it's important to cultivate it in our system. And I think it's gotta be a, like a two-way street. And I think a lot of what you're talking about is, you know, is you know, creating a redemption culture within our, our education system, which is hard 
in a time-based medical education system where you were judged by a a time you know a time stamp and there's not a lot of, of forgiveness in it so i don't know there's yeah you, this is totally um yeah I, I speaking of your people i could talk about this forever for sure yes yes well let, let's do this um you know as we think about virtue and 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 vocation i think that sometimes it's helpful to just kind of have in mind like who are, what are the character of those individuals that we're sort of talking about? So maybe just for a moment, I could ask the group, when you think about a good healthcare professional, what are those attributes that come to mind? So that'll be kind of the first part of the question. Then maybe just have this in mind. As you start to think about those attributes, which of those attributes do you feel like seem to come more natural for the people in your environment, for your learners and for others? And then which of those attributes seem like the ones that, you know, require some work that, that need a little bit of cultivating, if you will. So I was so excited to see Larry Churchill in the audience here because when I think about attributes of a good physician, of course, you know, back to this idea of vocation and purpose, you know, you judge the goodness of something in light of its purpose and how your book elevated the role of healer as sort of the the purpose and defining the good physician in relation to that um, ability to facilitate healing relationships. So I really loved that book, which looked at, as many of you know, the extraordinary clinicians, right, who really were standouts in that respect and called out, I think, some virtues that are pretty, you know, frequent flyers on lists of professional values. You know, I have them written here, things like compassion and empathy and respect and integrity, but others that maybe have not received the same degree of attention like humility and patience. And I know courage, for example, was not something that we talked about a whole lot, at least um, prior to COVID-19. And all of a sudden in the pandemic um, that really popped up and took a more prominent role. Um, so I really appreciated that work as a way of looking at what does it mean to be a good physician in light of that purpose of being a healer? Because often in education, we talk about um, like the purpose is to be trustworthy um, and entrustable, but yet you still need to push it a step further, trusted to do what, right? And I think talking about being a healer and not just a fixer, a healer, not just a technical um, expert um, really starts us looking in the right direction. I like the list you just gave, Andrea. I was looking at my own notes and I think we had pretty much the same list. Uh, I would add um, effective communicator and that's a virtue. I mean, it's not, you know, it's whatever. I'm making it a virtue. Uh, I think it's an important virtue in medicine and it is probably the one that of any virtue that we try to cultivate in our medical students, that's probably the one that we do the best job of. And, and still, I mean, whenever you're on wards and you cringe because the doctor trying to explain something to the patient does such a bad job, but we know that we still have a long way to go with that. But to think about trying to cultivate uh, whether in ourselves or in the students, humility, integrity, honesty, compassion, patience, right? Uh, those, those take a little bit more effort. Um, so I guess, Joe, to answer your question, I'd say we probably do the best at, at, at the virtue of effective communication, but we have a long way to go on all of them. That, that's funny because I, I teach a lot of communication. I feel like we're so terrible at teaching communication. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, my, my list had some some similarities, um, mostly the humility was definitely a really big one on the list. And the other things I really thought about was being reflective um, and really teaching how to cultivate a strong reflective practice. Um, I think that kind of goes hand in hand with accountability um, uh, so that we, you know, you can sort of look back and, and figure out how could I have done better? How can we do better? Um, I also really think an important uh, characteristic is curiosity. Um, I think we, and I, and maybe I'm, I'm sort of cynical in sort of the things that I thought that should be characteristics of a good doctor and things that we actually do um, teach. And I feel like in some ways we, we stymie curiosity 
in in our learning environment because we reward kind of more of being right rather than being curious a lot of times. And so I think that that sometimes can be difficult. Um, I also thought about being an advocate. So, you know, speaking up for the vulnerable and, and advocating for the vulnerable were other thoughts that I had. Yeah, justice was the one, was another one on the list um, from that healing healers book. Um, and that's, I, I definitely see that there's a passion there in our incoming students um, that is um, just on an upward trajectory. And there's a lot of motivation and interest in that direction. And I think that's something um, important to harness and provide uh, outlets for that. And, and I would pair the justice with the other thing I had on my list was like compassion assumption, which one of my colleagues likes to call it the compassion assumption. So always giving others the benefit of the doubt. So I feel like sometimes when we we have that fire for justice, but we don't listen in, in the same um, breath that it can really uh, maybe hinder things as opposed to help things. Yes. Yes. Such a wonderful list. I think I, I, I always kind of return first to humility, which was described. And, and I think just in light of COVID-19 and walking with learners through a very intense pandemic, um, resilience and, and even just perseverance, like just grit, like uh, I, I feel like that is something that's, you know, and I think about the individuals who seem to be thriving in the midst of a really challenging time, um, you know, it is the individuals who have learned how to be resilient and learned how to sort of um, persevere even when things are not going their way. So those are some that, that certainly come to mind. You know, among, among that list of, of things that there, there are many others, we could kind of talk at length about that, but just to kind of push us a little further, I really want us to maybe think through, you know, how we're actually cultivating some of those attributes within our learners. And so among the list, you know, which of those would you say are the ones that, um, you know, seem to not come as natural or are requiring um, more um, intentional um, feedback and learning um, as you're engaging with your students and, and colleagues? I, I know this, the humility word keeps coming up, but and, um, I had so many notes about that exact thing. I think um, to your point about um, taking that passion for, I think humility has been framed in medicine as like discerning your limitations and being willing to ask for help in sort of a knowledge skills sense. But there's so much more richness to that idea of humility because it speaks to your how you enter into conversations with people who really deeply disagree with you and how, you know, do you rage out or do you reach out, right? When you're encountering an idea that you feel strongly about and somebody else um, doesn't or, or feels strongly in a completely different direction. So that sort of humility about our, our deepest beliefs and the things that we're really um, dedicated to and then our humility about just accomplishments, right? I mean, I, I just read this book, um, The Tyranny of Merit um, by a professor at Harvard, Michael Sandel, about um, just having this like, li he calls it the lively sense of the contingency of your lot, right? That you happen to be born with talents or the dispositions to develop them or the community that supported you uh, and that they're valued in society and having that sort of humility there as well, which relates to the, these ideas of justice and things. But there's just, those are just some initial thoughts about how rich that idea of humility is. And I think that's one where we've been kind of superficial. And really when I think about the culture of medicine, it, it promotes confidence and excellence and um, things that I, I don't, I, I, humility has come out so strongly here, but it's not one that I often see elevated in that way. Yes, yes. You reminded me in my first year of medical school, it was our, one of the very first lectures. Um, it was very clear that the, the professor did not know the answer to a question that was being asked. And I remember just this moment where I just assumed that he would say, I don't know. And he said just about everything except I don't know. And I remember thinking like, I have just entered into something where it's no longer okay to say, I don't know. And so that's always stuck out in my mind, sort of just the humility of owning your weaknesses or owning when you don't know something. Um, that's something that even with the learners, you know, every time they're with me, they're so eager to learn about um, how to do a good exam on a two-year-old. 
And as they're as we're talking about that, I'm eager to kind of make sure that they understand that saying um, they don't know is is a good thing and a healthy thing, and that has to do with sort of their ability to see themselves um, in a system. So. That's interesting. I use that as, you know, you get these end of rotation evaluation forms, right? And they there's like a Likert scale, one to five professionalism, which is always like difficult to answer, right? But one of the things I always watch for is, did they say they didn't know or that they didn't do something and try to call it out and label it, say, I appreciate your honesty. That's fine. I forget to check the Babinski sometimes too, you know, no big deal. But I kind of watch for those moments because I think they're particularly revealing. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So, so maybe we could we can jump in then and talk a little bit together about you know examples um, or challenges that we've perceived in our efforts to cultivate virtue um, in our envir clinical environments with our learners, with our colleagues. And so, maybe I could invite each of you to sort of just think through like what do you, what have you seen as some of the challenges as you have tried to do this work, even with this example, Andrea of being with the learner and you know being very intentional to kind of highlight these virtues um, that probably you know not everybody's doing that. So, so I'd love to hear you know other examples and then even what have you seen as some of the challenges with trying to do this work? I mean, you want to go? I can go. Um, maybe just I'll just tell you quickly of, of just a tiny bit of background, I've been at Columbia for about a year and a half and was brought in to direct the Center for Clinical Medical Ethics. And specifically, uh, a big part of the mission was to invest in the sort of moral formation of Columbia medical students. So to really focus on these issues. And right away, I hit uh, lots of lots of barriers, uh, territoriality, you know, lots of people saying to me, well, we do ethics too, but at the end of the day, they write NIH grants to study, you know, whatever, you know, usually precision medicine actually at Columbia. Um, so they're not, they're not pulling the medical students aside and investing in them. Uh, so there's, there's, then there's questions about space in the formal curriculum. I've been repeatedly invited to submit ideas to expand the presence of ethics or character in the formal curriculum, and then that goes nowhere because there, everybody wants a, a piece of the game. And then there's a question of continuity. So you know, our students in their second year are on the wards uh, by January, and so we lose them. So even if I, you know, spend the first year really investing in them, then they're gone. Um, some of them I kind of have been able to hold on to. Some of them circle back in third year or fourth year, but it's been. Uh, difficult in contrast to what John Hart and those of you who are in a, a breakout room with John Hart, I encourage you to talk to him about what he's done at Loyola. But it's been hard to figure out how uh, how to have continuity with them. Having said that, my approach then has been to do almost everything outside of the formal curriculum. I do teach ethics formally in the curriculum, but uh, I, I I have multiple uh, approaches. Uh, the, probably the most effective of which is a philosophy and medicine group that self-selects. I have more than 90 students who have been a part of it and about 10 to 20 that are there every week. Uh, and we have a, something of a journal club. We've done a book club. We've done different things, but really reading small parts of rich texts and then talking about it. And those are students that have come back and said, you know, wow, it really matters what kind of a person I am. Uh, one student emailed me in December and she said, Dr. Dugdale, I'm an agnostic, but I, I keep, you know, talking to doctors and talking to patients who are religious. And I need to sort of figure out how I can talk to my patients about religion, even if I myself don't believe. Uh, so I, I've, I'm seeing kind of people struggle and want to take on uh, these questions of, of morality and character and who am I and what does this mean and what is my purpose, right? These questions of vocation, uh, but doing it in this, in this context uh, is, ha has lots of challenges. Um, maybe I'll just stop there. Yeah, I, I, can, I concur with a lot of what um, Lydia just shared. I think it's that tension between the explicit curriculum that you create and the hidden curriculum, right? With the, the culture that, that our learners encounter and the, the pressures, right? There's just a lot of pressure out there and a lot of stress. And so some, some of that I think is if there's not a pop-off ball to talk about moral injury 
um, to talk about how there are those stressors do exist and talk about um, have safe spaces for people to be vulnerable. I think it's going to be hard for people to evolve um, in, in these spaces as well. So I think that that's somewhat difficult. And, and so we've done uh, some curriculum really working on deliberate reflective practices. We, we try to pair it, we try to pair this um, with clinical competency as well. So sort of to dovetail that all of these things are really talking about the same issues, like the things that help you professionally, help you personally, they're, they're very intertwined. Um, and so really creating reflective practices on um, just learning goals and like, how did you learn and how did that go? And looking back on that, um, and then, and then, you know, creating ripples on like, how does that, how does that relate to bigger goals? Like we have a large, um, uh, you know, immigrant population who's unfunded um, and who's undocumented. Like, how does that ripple go out to there and like reflecting on the practice we do as a healthcare system? Um, so that's sort of what we really tried to put uh, reflection deliberately into a lot of different spaces in the internal medicine clerkship, which is like really my main domain. Um, and also um, really striking while the iron is hot, I think is really important. So um, Dr. Sue Cox is on this call and she was a big reason that our um, university got our small group learning communities, colleges, and she actually interviewed me to be a college's mentor. So thank you, Dr. Cox. Um, and so um, I'm now an assistant course director for that. And when everything happened with COVID, it was just a real opportunity for us to talk about race something that is not easy to talk about in, in the South. Um, probably not anywhere, but definitely not in the South. And so um, we really used that opportunity to uh, create a session. Um, the, the thing that we, we come across though is not, we don't have um, you know, a, a school of ethics or a large you know, group of ethicists here at our university. And so we don't have as many trained professionals to sort of masterfully um, teach these sessions or work through these issues and kind of going back to what you were talking about before, Joe, I mean, it's really wrestling in the gray where as, as, a, as a human race, I don't think we're comfortable in the gray where we much rather things be, you know, surviving, dangerous, safe, you know, um, and really the fact that you can be both at once, um, we're not comfortable with. And so, really having um, a group of trained professionals who have time <laughs> as well as um, the ability is what we kind of come up against. Um, you know, sometimes like speaking to communication, we have some trained people, but that bench is, is small. Like, and so we're tired. So we get tired and burnt out from always doing all the teaching for the residents in the school. And so creating a deeper bench um, of people who are trained, I think would help help face these challenges um, and then really kind of working on the system to create safe spaces for people to talk about the truth, the true challenges of, of patient care so that they too can remain to be compassionate and help kind of tamper down some of that um, hidden curriculum that we find. So I'll try to piggyback on those really rich examples with in my, in my role, I'm, I'm thinking at that system level. Um, so some examples of some of the work we've tried to do at the system. So to your point about safe space, I think one thing we've heard from learners is don't over orchestrate things. Like we, we want, we need places to talk about these sorts of things. Um, and you don't have to like micromanage and script everything that happens there. Um, so for example, the medical students have a, a, a safe harbor touch point where they come back from their clerkships and their internships, sub internships and meet with each other to debrief about the sorts of things they're encountering. And at the residency, you know, we have, I don't know how many, uh, almost a hundred perhaps. I mean, so many different residency and fellowship programs. So figuring out how to scale something, right? Because often the bench is pretty small. So something that we're looking to try is creating some trigger videos or some materials that can be used to just get the conversation started by getting respected folks on the staff who are willing to share a vulnerable story about a personal loss or a career change or a failure or an error or some of those really formative things. And then tapping into our network of emeritus faculty to come and facilitate things. So they're not in the position of evaluating residents or making advancement decisions, but could be kind of um, 
trained up and encouraged that often they have this, you know, wealth of wisdom, right, and history just from having lived a career in a particular specialty that they can bring to these conversations. So that's an example of how we're trying to create materials and people to help um, scale something um, at a big level. And then, um, so space, space and scale, and then the other um, and safety. And then two other points. So one is trying to kind of give our learners a lens, right? So I quickly realized that our evaluation forms would ask students like, did you experience or witness mistreatment during your rotation? And we thought it would be helpful to add a parallel question. Did you witness any exemplary demonstrations of the Mayo Clinic values? And that was in part, I mean, we've tried in part to like prompt a little moment of reflection when you're filling out your evaluation to think back. And it's, it's the most uplifting reading of my whole year when those comments come in and then feeding those back into the practice. Cause a lot of times those sorts of virtues and exemplariness you know, it, it's, it doesn't get gratitude. I mean, patients are sick, they're suffering, they're not always grateful. This, these things happen in exam rooms and in hospital rooms and they are not um, always getting the attention and the applause that a researcher may with grants and other publications and things. So it was a way to really kind of affirm something positive happening in our practice environment. So that, that trying to give our learners a lens to prompt a little moment for them and an opportunity to celebrate in the practice and then thirdly, trying to amplify patient voices. So just as on a systems level, right, we use Prescani as our vendor for patient experience surveys, but their sampling strategy does not capture trainees well. And it would be um, really difficult to use their mechanism to, to get feedback for our learners. So we're trying to devise a different system so that we can trigger surveys for our learners so they get feedback from their patients. So I, I, those are you know, step removed from inter, interfacing with actual individuals, but some ways we've been trying to work at a systems level to move these forward, these ideas forward. Hmm. Wonderful, these are, these are great examples and the challenges abound and I'm struck by for as much work as you and others are doing to cultivate virtue. Um, we also um, turns out have colleagues who kind of are teaching by their negative examples. And so that kind of adds another layer to the complexity of the things that we try to, to implement. So we've come to a point now where you're gonna transition. Um, so thank you everyone for getting this conversation started. And I know there's a lot of wisdom among all of the participants. So I hope we can continue to have these dialogues in our small group and then we'll have an opportunity to get back together again at the end.